Welcome to The Business Coach, a show in which you out help entrepreneurs better their businesses. My name is Ian Dennis and tonight on the show we have a special show because I have a guest whom I had the privilege of sitting down with a week back, T.D. Jakes. So tonight for everybody who said, oh, 75,000 in Yingi, oh, you can't pay this and this. Well, I'll be bringing up this particular conversation with T.D. Jakes to your home for free. So all you need to do is just tweet us on hashtag KTN Business Coach at Ian Dennis Network at KTN Kenya to enjoy this particular conversation. So welcome to the show. Thomas Dexter Jakes, commonly known as T.D. Jakes, is known world over as the pastor of the Porter's House, a non-denominational American megachurch. But what very few people know about T.D. Jakes is that he is and has been an entrepreneur for most of his life. When he is not wearing the hat of a pastor, he is the CEO of T.D. Jakes Enterprises that has been in existence for over two decades, longer than the Porter's House. T.D. Jakes Enterprises specializes in publishing, music and film. He is a best-selling author of over 40 books, he has created over 20 albums and has 9 films under his belt. His profile can go on and on but ladies and gentlemen, here's an exclusive interview with T.D. Jakes. So ladies and gentlemen, today on the show we have a gentleman I've been longing to meet for a very, very long time. The gentleman who needs no introduction. I think we've been sharing a lot of his videos through our WhatsApp and everywhere. So ladies and gentlemen, T.D. Jakes. Thank you. It's Welcome a pleasure. to Kenya. It's a pleasure to be here. I was actually checking out the promos, so you know a bit of Swahili. Jumbo. <laughs> Jumbo. <laughs> Very little. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little. <laughs> ah, interesting. One of the interesting things, when I was, uh, when the promotion for the, this particular soul conference was mm -hmm. going on, one day I was actually driving with the Uber driver, and we saw your image there, and one of the things that usually struck the driver was that you're a businessman and an author. Mm -hmm. We know you as the on your ministry side. Mm -hmm. And when I was going through past interviews that you did with the Breakfast Club, I mm -hmm. got to understand that you grew up in a family that's entrepreneurial. Your father was an entrepreneur. How exactly was it for you growing up in an entrepreneurial family? You know, I didn't really realize at the time when I was a child that it would have such an impression on me. But I just happened to be in the room where he and my mother or he and various business people would be having conversations about business. I cannot stress how important it is to raise your children in the atmosphere of your business as opposed to shooing them away because inevitably that affected how I saw life and what my normatives were because I grew up in a family where they had taxes and payrolls and, and, and things like that to handle, uh, to manage money and budget and that sort of thing was a part of the narrative that I heard as a child and it served me well as I became a man. And interestingly, your dad passed on when you were 16. That's right. And by the time you had, your dad had 52 employees, which actually in the 60s in the States it's a lot, it's not a small deal, it's a big deal. It was a big deal at the time. How did your father influence you in terms of business? I think the first thing, when I think of my dad, I think of a work ethic. He had a very strong work ethic. He insisted that I have one too. And uh, he was tenacious and relentless. And he inspired me because he had very little to work with, a very little excess capital to work with. He had to grow his own capital while he was growing his business. And the reason I wrote the book Soar is because so many of us don't have access to the capital that we would like to have. So what do we do in the absence of that? My father uh, epitomized that in how he uh, grew his business and it helped me both as a business person and it helped me as a pastor founding a church as well. And speaking about capital, which is one of the biggest limitations for any entrepreneur, especially here in Kenya, I believe all across the world. Mm -hmm. how, how does one go up, any entrepreneur or any person wishing to get into business, how can you, which way can you, what's it called, bootstrap your way into getting to your dream? Because I know capital is always an excuse for each and every person who wants to get to it. It's a real problem, but it is better today than it's ever been because of technology, because of social media. The, your cost for advertisement has gone down exponentially than what it used to be to buy radio time or television time or just to depend on billboards. That, that creates an opportunity for great savings. What we have to do is put some of that money back and reinvest it back into the business and budget sometimes somewhat severely in order to believe in your dream. Starting anything initially, a lot of times I think we rush to success because we want to impress people with our accomplishments. But uh, gratification delayed is very effective when it comes to building a business. You have to understand that there are going to be years of sacrifice and then there's going to be years of surplus. And if you have the surplus before you have the sacrifice, your business doesn't last very long. And speaking about that, um, about your journey, you started entry, you got into business quite early. So take me through your journey. How was that? 
I can't think of a time in my life that I haven't worked uh, outside of ministry. All of my life, uh, people didn't see it, it wasn't on television, but I've always been entrepreneurial, always dabbled in real estate. My mother dabbled in real estate. Uh, it set a prerequisite for me in my life. And uh, though it started on a very small scale, uh, as the Bible would say, despise not the day of small beginnings. Yeah. You need small beginnings so that you can work out uh, your mistakes while they are still small. And you need them because you're going to build the kinds of relationships that are necessary to sustain the business as it grows. Because really at the core of business is nothing but relationships. Re let me just say this one thing. Relationships are your greatest resource. And uh, if you don't understand that, it is not necessarily the absence of capital, it's the absence of relationships. If you have strong relationships, you can access capital. One of the interesting things, I was actually just going through your bio, the first, the first book that you published, you actually exhausted all your savings, You're right. your wife. How exactly was that particular period for you? Scary, <laughs> scary. <laughs> it was all the money we had. It was the money we were saving to get a house. I had to self-publish in my first book. I didn't really know whether it was going to work or not, but again, being tenacious and relentless and believing in what you have, because I think that's another thing that's very, very important. If you yourself don't believe in what you're doing, nobody else is going to believe in it either. I believed in the message that I had. I believed in the book that I'd written enough to invest in it and then to go out there and not just stop at believing, but put the works behind it that's necessary in terms of going back there and getting back those resources uh, that we had invested in it so that we could see a return and, and see the build. Now that book has been translated into 12 different languages, traveled around the world and sold millions of copies. But at that time, I was selling books out the trunk of my car. <laughs> yeah, literally out the trunk of my car, and my kids were helping me at the book tables to sell. Interesting. And I was just Googling your age when I was joking before you started the interview. You are 62. I am. And you have energy like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> My kids help a lot, you know, uh, and I've been blessed with uh, a lot of energy. And I think that I would lose energy if I lost challenge. It is the challenge in front of me that gives me the motivation to get out of the bed every morning. I don't pay much attention to age. I, I pay more attention to what I'm trying to do. I'm purpose driven. And so when you are purpose driven, that, is, that ignites passion and energy and enthusiasm. Um, I want to talk a bit about ministry. Okay. And in Africa, one of the things that quote unquote you say that religion is the opium of the poor. People associate you being religious to you being poor. And yet I know in the Bible there's so many instances that talk about entrepreneurship and talks about going out and multiplying. So take me through that. First of all, I, I, don't, I don't think that we should marginalize Christianity to the poor. Uh, because Christianity at its core is about salvation and everybody needs that regardless to who you are. And so if we just market it to poor people as if their problem is money, Christ didn't die on the cross for money. He died on the cross that we might have eternal life. And so eternal life should not be exempt from anybody. So uh, the whole notion of Christianity being primarily for the poor is uh, a misnomer all by itself. And then when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus had tax collectors, he had uh, business people around him. All of his disciples were in some sort of business one way or another. Uh, there were women who supported his ministry as well as reaching out to the poor. So it's not just going to the rich or going to the poor, it's going to the world. And the world is filled with everything and everybody. And you want to touch everybody with the message. And it's being in the business world and being a minister, I'm sure there's so many challenges you've seen and overcome over the period of time. Which was your hardest period that you faced being in business and also being in ministry? Uh, good people. Uh, m above anything else, finding quality, trusted, loyal, committed people who will work just as diligently when you're not looking as they do when you are looking, that's hard to find. You cannot, you cannot teach loyalty. Uh, de you can, degrees does not necessarily indicate loyalty. So finding quality people, and I would say to anybody listening right now, people, great people are your greatest investment. They're hardest to find and they're hard to keep. And so if you don't have good people, you can have a great product, you can have a great vision, you can have a great idea, but it's great people that implement those ideas and cause them to become a reality. I was 
making a, what's it called, a comment on you earlier on that your well of wisdom never drives up. Drives up. <laughs> There's tons of sermons online. There's tons of speeches. There's tons of interviews, and you keep on everything. Every time I hear you, you're always fresh. How do you keep up? Do you read a lot? What exactly do you do? I read a lot and I have a lot of experiences. I mean, I'm in Kenya right now. I get to travel around the world. I get to meet the most interesting people. And I think that the world is a university in it and everybody in it is a teacher. And if you wake up in the morning and go to school, you learn from every experience. And I think that I am so blessed to, to be in places like this or in Australia or to have gone to South America and to have dined the, from the cuisine of the world to have met some of the most prominent people in the world and some of the brightest people in the world and to walk away void of, of, of intellect, intelligence, and wisdom would mean that I didn't pay attention. And so many people have great opportunities, but they have poor attention. After the break, T.D. Jakes continues to share more of his wisdom, so don't touch that dial, but keep it right here on The Business Coach, where we help entrepreneurs better their businesses.